fail to or refuse to act um, when it has actual knowledge of harassment or um, misconduct. Um, so that's a pretty high bar, um, evidentiary bar, and just, you know, um, a lot of emotional turmoil, I think, goes into trying to meet that standard. But um, I think Alexandra can give us some, some concrete examples of what deliberate indifference looks like in practice. Sure. So, I mean, look, this the tricky thing coming to you as an attorney who does Title IX cases is I want to say at once that, um, you know, survivors are able to meet that standard in some cases. So it's, um, I, I don't want to overstate how bad deliberate indifference is. You know, many of my clients, especially um, in K-12 schools, will respond to the school and the school will act clearly unreasonably. And that's really the test under deliberate indifference. You know, did the school act clearly unreasonably? And a school that you know, refuses to investigate a report, uh, you know, a school that refuses to provide supportive services to a student, as we see it, and as some good courts have seen it, um, is acting um, with deliberate indifference. Um, but in recent years, we've seen um, a really disturbing turn in how, just how reluctant schools are to find that deliberate indifference. Um, so, um, you know, often these courts are essentially saying, as long as the school did anything, um, even if it clearly wasn't meant to resolve the problem, that's enough. So I read a, a opinion recently where the school, where the court said, well, it wasn't deliberately indifferent for the school to fail to investigate the report because they asked the alleged harasser to interview with them. And, and he said, no. So what, what were they supposed to do? And they just kind of gave up um, and didn't do anything. Uh, and a, another pattern that we're starting to see emerge is courts um, requiring that students prove that the school's deliberate indifference caused them to experience further actionable harassment. So to put this in sort of concrete terms, there was a recent case in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit where a student was um, raped by a classmate. Uh, she reported to the school. The school uh, took some very minimal steps in response, but didn't, didn't stop him from you know, continuing to sort of follow her around. And she was afraid to walk around her campus. She was afraid to go to the dining hall because she thought that she was gonna see him. And the school had made very clear that they weren't gonna do anything to stop that. Uh, and the Sixth Circuit said, well, she didn't get raped again. You know, after she reported to the school, she wasn't subject to severe and pervasive sexual harassment, which is a, a high bar. Um, so the school wasn't deliberately indifferent. And uh, that's a, a, a standard that we're worried that other courts will start to adopt. We're worried that the Supreme Court might adopt it. Um, and, uh, you know, that is, uh, that really doesn't respond to the uh, experience of survivors in schools, so many of whom you know, take steps to protect themselves from further harassment at the cost of their education. So students, you know, will stop attending school. They will start um, attending cyber programs rather than actually in-person school. They will take leaves of absence in order to protect themselves. But those very steps then end up getting used against them um, in court because they can't prove the further harassment. And, you know, I should flag that the organization I work for, Public Justice, doesn't um, endorse or oppose judicial nominees, but I think that it is not, um, what, what I can certainly observe is that we have, you know, whatever hope we had that the Supreme Court was going to reject this rule when it was a 5-4 court um, has, it has, will certainly diminish if it is a 6-3 court, and we're very worried about that. Thank you both so much. I mean, this is incredibly helpful. So, you know, Alexandra talked about how some ways that we end up in court are that survivors may bring these suits affirmatively, but we are also seeing a increasing number of people who are disciplined for sexual harassment in schools um, challenging that discipline. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about what's happening in those lawsuits? Sure, um, and I promise I'm not gonna talk this much for the whole hour, um, I'm front loaded. Um, so, uh, 
You know, we've seen lawsuits, as I mentioned, from um, students and teachers, um, mostly men, um, sanctioned for committing sexual harassment um, brought under, under Title IX and sometimes an analogous sex discrimination law, Title VII, that applies to the workplace. Um, and, uh, you know, th there's sort of different doctrinal theories um, of, you know, what kind, where the sex discrimination is. So sometimes um, these plaintiffs will say that, um, you know, I was accused of sexual harassment. If I had been a woman accused of sexual harassment, I wouldn't have been sanctioned in this way. Um, or they'll say, um, you know, you came to the wrong outcome. I really didn't do it. You found that I did do it. And you came to that conclusion because I was a man. Um, and what actually Judge Barrett recently held in an opinion is, look, these are all kind of the different ways of saying the same thing, which is, I was discriminated against because in this disciplinary process because of my sex. Um, and, you know, I'll be honest that this trend really worries me the way, you know, just how receptive the courts have been um, to these lawsuits. So I want to be really clear again that these are not um, lawsuits saying my due process rights were violated. That's a pretty standard lawsuit for a student to bring. Um, when they've been subject to unfair disciplinary procedures under due process or contract law. Um, and with that kind of lawsuit, if a school really has screwed up um, in how they discipline someone for sexual harassment, um, that's a problem that they need to fix. And it's one that doesn't come at the cost of survivors. Uh, but what these lawsuits are doing, and particularly the, you know, what the courts are doing with these lawsuits is really the way I would put it, um, is using Title IX to make it harder for schools to support survivors um, who come forward with reports of sexual harassment. Um, because almost anything that they do um, is to, that ends up favoring the, the complainant, the person saying they've been harassed, over the respondent, the person accused of harassment, is taken as being anti-male bias. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, even though um, there might not be any evidence of a pattern, um, that's even though, uh, you know, respondents and complainants can be people of all genders, you know, people of all genders hurt people of all genders, but there's this assumption that anytime a school even just believes a respondent over a complainant, that that's motivated by anti-male bias, um, which like, let me be clear, that's absolutely ridiculous. So, you know, I wanna give you an example of a particularly disturbing case out of the US Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. There was a um, student, a male student, um, who was suspended from a private college for sexually assaulting two of his female classmates. And the court found that he had adequately alleged that his suspension was motivated by anti-male bias, um, principally because the school had punished him, but not the two women who had accused him of sexual assault. Um, so for, for one of these women, um, you know, she had said that he had assaulted her. He had said that they had had consensual sex. Um, the court accepted the position that even though he had said that their encounter had been consensual, that the school should have investigated her, the complainant, because he, because the guy had at some point during that night had a couple of drinks. And so they should have investigated her to see if she had raped him. And the fact that they didn't meant that they were biased for women against men. And, you know, again, that, what that means is that in this third circuit right now, uh, schools are under incredible pressure because of a sex discrimination law to investigate survivors of sexual assault for raping their assailants. And that's not a problem that a school can fix with good procedures. If their procedures had been absolutely perfect, unobjectionable, uh, this exact same claim would have succeeded. Um, and you know, I, I'm uh, I think that that is legally um, indefensible, and I'm very, very worried about how schools are going to respond to these um, these opinions. Thank you. That is um, extraordinarily troubling. Does anyone else want to jump in on some of the ways that respondent lawsuits are impacting school complaints and survivors' experiences? 
Yeah, for sure. So um, Alexandra's talked a lot about why this is legally concerning um, and then getting down to sort of like what we're seeing on the ground, how this is impacting um, survivors' lives. Um, is equally as concerning, if not more. So I, as part of my role as the Courts Project Fellow, have been talking with survivors um, this fall who have reported in years past, like really over the past 20 years, but especially over the past like six to eight, um, and, and seeing what exactly those survivors have been dealing with. And what I've been hearing a lot about is that survivors more and more are um, being filed against themselves, um, like Alexandra was talking about. So a survivor goes forward to the school and says, this person raped or sexually assaulted me. Um, and then maybe a couple of months go by. Um, and then the respondent, so the student who was named as the harasser in that first case is coming forward and saying, no, actually they harassed me or they assaulted me. Um, and, and sometimes that can happen in the reverse order, um, no blanket statement on that, but what we're seeing sometimes is that some of the same attorneys who represent these students who have been accused of or disciplined for sexual harassment seem to be leveraging that as a strategy. Um, and then when we see that it's leading to cases like the ones Alexandra's describing down the road in the courts where um, then the, you know, the student who's been disciplined for sexual harassment says, well, why didn't they investigate this as an assault against me? And they're pointing to that case that they filed below. And so it's kind of this whole built-in strategy that's sometimes being used um, that's not necessarily like a good faith reporting of an actual instance of discrimination or violence. And we're seeing schools respond to this in a really frightening way because schools know that when they get sued, it hurts their pockets. Regardless of if they're in the right or in the wrong, they have to pay a lot to defend against even a mere allegation in court. And I mean, schools have made that clear. Many administrators have said that directly to survivors I've spoken with or have suggested that to attorneys who are representing those survivors. Um, and it's gone so far as I was speaking with a survivor last month who gave me permission to share this, that she had gone forward about her rape, complained to her school, her rapist was found responsible, was disciplined, um, so he was suspended for the next semester. Six months after being found responsible and suspended, he went forward to the school and said, no, actually that night she raped me. And the school normally would see that as like clearly retaliatory because in the initial case he had said nothing ever even happened and, and um, then said it was consensual. And so the story shifted all these times. Under Title IX, you're not supposed to be able to retaliate in that way, but because schools are so afraid that they're gonna be sued, the Title IX coordinator essentially told her, look, I know he was already found responsible. He was already punished for this. I know it's probably not true because he hasn't given any you know, theories and because he's really brought in his attorney on this, whatever. But we have to investigate it because we can't be hit with a lawsuit. And so then that survivor, as she told me, had to read his 10, 15, 20 pages of his explanation of why she was too ugly to this, to that, for him to ever assault and that therefore she had to have assaulted him. So. That's just one example that's really not as uncommon as it seems um, that we're seeing a lot of trends in the way that you know schools are kind of backing up and, and getting worried about these lawsuits preemptively and buckling to them in those ways. Um, it just like preemptively. Um, and then I, I also in, in the process of speaking with survivors, we've been kind of taking a survey and gathering data and we've um, spoken with or surveyed over 100 survivors who have reported to their schools in particular. And in nearly 20% of those cases, um, the student respondent, the student who was alleged to be the harasser, actually explicitly threatened to sue the school um, throughout the process. So that's not necessarily um, those who did, but they're threatening throughout the process. And even spoke with one attorney who said that there was um, a respondent who through their attorney said to the school, you know, change this procedure or else we'll be ready to sue. And the school said, I'm sorry, I just, we can't take that hit and change the procedure. Um, so respondents know this and their attorneys know this and it's becoming um, a more and more rampant strategy that's really ultimately coming down on survivors' backs in schools. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing the really uh, disturbing status quo. Um, Jamie, could you share a little, a little bit about your work on how courts often can, you know, the court system and the legal system can even play a role in furthering abuse against survivors? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so lately, I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, abuse and harassment is fundamentally about power and control. And one of the ways that um, perpetrators can exert power and control over their victims is actually through the legal system. So they use the uh, procedures available to them um, through the courts to actually perpetuate the abuse. And even though the abuse might not be physical in nature, it's often emotional and financial. Um, so uh, some examples of that are, you know, as Sarah mentioned, accusing the victim of being the actual abuser. So counterfiling against them in a lot of instances, you'll also see cases where they will um, try and um, relitigate things that have already been litigated um, in attempts to embarrass or expose the survivor or even intimidate them. Um, there are also instances where um, perpetrators will, you know, threaten survivors with, you know, outside agencies like ICE if they have immigration concerns. There are lots of ways that the um, procedural mechanisms of the court actually facilitate abuse. The name of this phenomenon itself is not even kind of coined perfectly. Some people call it abusive litigation. Some people call it retaliatory litigation. Um, I've heard of paper abuse before. It's been written about sporadically, but there's no, I think, defined consensus about what this actually is. Um, and there are very few kind of broad federal, you know, statutes addressing and preventing um, this type of behavior. So it's hard to identify um, until it's already kind of gone too far. Um, so I found that one of the most insidious ways is also financial. Um, I'm sure you've heard a lot about, you know, these really incredible actually funds for survivors um, that are um, been popping up since 2017, um, like the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund and all of these, you know, types of funds, they actually usually don't cover defenses. So if survivor is sued in some sort of abusive litigation or as a strategy to further abuse, um, those funds actually won't protect them or, you know, provide money for them to present an adequate defense. So what you're left with is survivors draining themselves of their financial resources, you know, putting huge burdens on their mental health, their family, their friends and communities um, to kind of protect themselves from this abuse. Um, and I think that I would really hope to see one day judges, um, lawyers and other practitioners really come together to name um, and try to prevent this type of behavior. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. Um, I think a large part of what Jamie's talking about is like these defamation suits we're seeing where someone who's then accused of sexual assault or harassment, even like in a school process alone, not in a court of law, um, is then suing the survivor and saying, you're defaming me. And a lot of times folks who bring those lawsuits are, um, or I guess folks who talk about those lawsuits talk about them as nobody can make an allegation against me um, when in fact that's not what the law says <laughs> um, and but the, like like we said just the mere act of dragging someone into court costs them money and as Jamie just pointed out again like those those resources aren't necessarily there for survivors because it's sort of a newer a newer trend we're seeing at least in the campus space um, but just going back to the survey again, we, what we found is again, that a bunch of survivors didn't know that other survivors were going through this when in fact, um, about a quarter of survivors have been threatened by their, um, respondent or the respondent's attorney with some sort of defamation suit and, um, about a fifth of them. So almost as many of uh, survivors have been told by their school be careful what you say, because you might be sued for defamation. And, uh, you know, whether that's a, a good faith warning or not, that can really chill a survivor's willingness to come forward, as well as their, their friends and community members' willingness to come forward. Um, but then one other sort of way that um, courts are enabling this further abuse against survivors is uh, through this process of granting records that would otherwise be considered con confidential to respondents and their attorneys. So we've seen um, trends and you know it's not a new strategy, but maybe in this realm of respondents requesting or subpoenaing uh, the counseling records, for instance, of a survivor to, 
say, you know, I bet there's something in there that I can use um, to prove my case. And generally, um, you know, at the title at the school level, the school would say like that's not appropriate. Or if it was a school counselor and this was happening in court, the school would say those records are confidential. We're not disclosing them, and the court would potentially agree. But what we've seen, there was a case um, just this past year against Syracuse where the student who had been disciplined sued and said, I wanna see my survivor's counseling records because I'm pretty sure that there was some discrimination happening in there. And she was coerced to file this against me. And where normally, you know, we would hope that a court would say those are confidential records, that's not a proper usage of them. Um, the court actually said, oh, we can maybe see where you're coming from there based on largely naked allegations. Um, and handed these records over to that respondent. And that's really harmful because survivors need to be able to seek mental health support in the wake of violence uh, without a fear of all of that information being released. And also we know that what survivors are going through isn't necessarily going to speak to a respondent's case against their school. So that's another really alarming trend in addition to the financial sort of abuse that Jamie was talking about that we've seen courts allowing abusers to um, exercise through the court system. So um, it seems like we have a lot of emerging disturbing issues. Um, Alexandra, I wanted to uh, give this back to you to talk about any other patterns in Title IX litigation that have emerged over the last four years that trouble you the most. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot to choose from, as you said. Um, it, I will flag one thing that I'm worried about, um, which I think isn't just a problem for student survivors in Title IX, um, but for all victims of discrimination, sex discrimination and otherwise in and out of schools, um, which is that a lot of courts uh, have been um, adopting this framework where they say, uh, you know, a, a respondent has come forward as a plaintiff alleging anti-male bias. And we think that that's credible because during the Obama administration, the Department of Education took um, some robust steps to uh, enforce Title IX requirements um, for student survivors. So um, as many of you likely know, um, during the Obama administration, the department issued um, additional policy guidances about Title IX. It had been doing that since the 90s, um, but it you know, sent another letter to schools saying, hey guys, under Title IX, you have to respond to sexual harassment against your students. Here's you know, a reminder of what that means. Um, the department also started uh, doing a better job of actually holding schools to that. Um, so I can say this because I was in school before all of this good stuff happened, but um, the, the department used to investigate schools and then not really make its findings public. Um, but under the sort of later years of the Obama administration, if it found that a school had violated the law, it would publicly announce that. Uh, and so these courts are saying, well, the fact that schools were under pressure to respect survivors' Title IX rights supports a respondent's claim that men are being discriminated against. And that is wrong for a lot of reasons. I mean, one of them, just to sort of get technical about it, is that uh, whatever you thought about the Obama administration's Title IX efforts, they weren't sex specific. Um, they called on schools to do right by survivors, including by investigating allegations against the people alleged to have harassed them. Um, it didn't say, you know, go out and suspend all the boys. Uh, in the sort of the biggest of the policy guidances, it doesn't even mention, it doesn't use gendered terms, except when it's describing some specific statistics about rates at which different uh, groups of people are harassed. So um, even if you thought that those civil rights efforts put pressure on schools to discipline people, which I don't, I don't know if that's entirely fair, but even if that you thought that that was true, it was not a sex specific anti-male pressure. But more fundamentally, and this is where I get worried sort of in a trans substantive way, um, we don't wanna live in a world where civil rights agencies doing their jobs and enforcing civil rights law gives rise to claims of discrimination by the people uh, doing the discriminating. 
Uh, so let's take this out of the Title IX context maybe to make it clear. So imagine that the Department of Justice um, under a Biden administration uh, investigates a police department for racial profiling. Let's say that that police department uh, fires some white cops for being racist. Those white cops could potentially use this theory to say, because the Department of Justice was putting pressure on uh, my agency to stop racism, I was the victim of anti-white bias. And like, that's ridiculous. Let's be clear about that. That's ridiculous. And it's really going to tie the hands of federal agencies who might worry that whatever they do to try to enforce the law, they're actually just going to make it harder for you know, different entities to root out discrimination. And I think it's going to make, it's really going to be a tough call for activists. You know, back in the early days of Know Your Nine, we were pushing the Obama administration to do better. And it honestly breaks my heart that by in succeeding in getting them to enforce Title IX, we created the facts that courts are now using um, as evidence of anti-male bias. I think that's unequivocally wrong, um, but I don't want activists to have to decide uh, to stay quiet because they're worried that whatever they say is gonna end up in a lawsuit filed by a harasser. Yeah, I am. Um had the remarkable experience of uh, like this actually happened to a number of student activists that I knew and like there was like work that a group that I was involved in when I was in college was like cited in a a lawsuit brought against you know the school related to a claim against one of our friends and one of our student activists and I mean we didn't it didn't have a chilling effect on us but this was the first lawsuit of that kind and I can't imagine how disturbing that must be for someone else um, when it becomes widespread. So thank you, Alexandra, Jamie, and Sarah for outlining the ways that courts are turning against survivors' rights and are using civil rights law to advance sex discrimination rather than sex equality. This is a, a disturbing trend, but I think what I want to talk about with our, you know, the latter half of our time here is that we didn't end up here by random chance. We ended up in this situation because of a concerted effort by the conservative legal movement to take over, to pack the federal judiciary. Today, it's an article of faith among political talking heads or politicians that the right cares about the courts and progressives don't. Um, that's not by accident. Starting in the 1970s, powerful groups on the right, like the Chamber of Commerce and the Federalist Society, um, launched a multi-decade effort to take over the federal courts. This was in large part backlash to civil rights progress like Roe and Brown. Um, it was well financed by corporate interests that wanted to make it a lot harder to hold them accountable for their bad behavior. And so we ended up in a situation where there is this enormous asymmetry between until now, um, right-wing organizing around the courts and progressive organizing around the courts. And as a result, um, we, during the Obama administration, President Obama and Senate Democrats left open a number of seats that we ought to and could have filled um, because, you know, that wasn't the battle that they were, they were waging effectively. You know, you can, we might dispute whether or not that was the right call, um, but, what we do know is that that's not what Trump and McConnell have done over the last four years. It is very clear today, more than ever, that Mitch McConnell's number one priority, the Republican Senate majority's number one priority is confirming judicial nominations. They're refusing to act on COVID-19 economic aid while 10 million people are out of work and a thousand people are dying every day. Look at, but they have plenty of time to confirm not just Barrett, but they are also moving forward with a number of lower court nominations. And the people that they are choosing are much younger than the nominees that Democrats pick. Um, the average Republican nominee is five to seven years younger than the average Democratic nominee. And because these are lifetime appointments, that means five to seven more years that these people are making decisions about our lives. Um, and they tend to be extraordinarily radical. Um, many of them are also, you know, concerningly unqualified. Um, so to give a couple examples, there, uh, Judge Rao on the DC circuit, which is a very influential circuit, has um, sort of trafficked in like pretty disturbing rape myths. Um, other judges have 
refused to say that Brown v. Board was rightly decided. And many of them are very clearly itching um, to overturn Roe v. Wade and are actively resisting um, lawsuits are actively resisting um, precedent on the books that is protective of abortion rights. So I think, you know, right now we face a judiciary that has been trained to be opposed to our values um, and where the numbers are not on our side. At this point, um, Republican appointed justices make up the majority of 12 out of the 13 federal appellate circuits. That's a level between trial courts and Supreme Court. Um, you know, not every judge is a perfect reflection of the party that appointed them, but it's a pretty good marker for a lot of them. And I think it's a concerning reality. Um, a quarter of active federal judges have now been appointed by Donald Trump. And so, you know, we see how dangerous this is for survivors' rights, but also for civil rights broadly, because now we have a situation where, you know, only one justice on the Supreme Court is willing to say that Donald Trump's decision to repeal DACA was very clearly motivated by racism. And we cannot get a majority on the Supreme Court to say, you know, the Muslim ban was very obviously motivated by religious discrimination. So this is kind of, I think the so we have two core takeaways here. I think a key one is that we face a court system that is fundamentally currently hostile to civil rights to sex equality and to equality across a number of other intersecting identities. So I guess what I want to talk about for the next part of our talk is that, you know, we do have options for what to do about that. We have options for how to unbreak the courts. Um, these options fall into two buckets. And while I'm speaking, you know, I'm going to lay out a number of options that are on the table. I think some of these are better than others, but I'm just going to put them all on the table so everyone has a chance to assess them for themselves. So bucket one is to change the composition of the courts, and bucket two is to limit the court's power over these issues. So first, changing the composition of the courts. So, you know, one option is to simply do nothing and wait and hope that as progressives win elections, the composition of the Supreme Court will change through retirements or to through people um, passing away. I think that is not an option. I think that is not tenable in large part because we are seeing courts be extraordinarily hostile to voting rights. In the last week alone on voting rights alone, the Seventh Circuit upheld Wisconsin's program of mass voter suppression. The Fifth Circuit reinstated the Texas governor's order limiting mail-in ballot drop-off locations to just one per county, including say Harris County where nearly 5 million people live. The Supreme Court let Donald Trump stop the census without an argument. Um, and just today, the Fifth Circuit said that, you know, people don't have a right, you know, this is one circuit, I, I don't want to misinform people about their rights, but the Fifth Circuit has put forward an argument that says that um, people don't have a due process right when a judge might, or like an election official might throw out your mail-in ballot, which seems patently absurd, right? But they are creating, you know, these enormous barriers to us actually winning elections and to actually, you know, allowing this to go forward. So I think this is a massive threat to this is such a significant threat to our democratic process that doing nothing is simply not an option. And if that's just one week of bad decisions on one issue, you know, we also would be in, you know, a lot of other bad decisions would be in store on survivors' rights and a lot of other things. So not an option. So what can we do? We can expand the courts. Um, the most frequently discussed court reform proposal on the table is packing the courts and specifically adding seats to the Supreme Court. Contrary to popular belief, it is not constitutionally required that the court have nine justices. It's actually a decision that's left up to Congress. And in fact, in the founding era, we had just six justices. At other times in our history, we've had five, seven, or 10 justices. And that's not even counting when Mitch McConnell lowered the number of Scottish justices to just eight, uh, when he refused to consider President Obama's nominee to replace Justice Scalia. So, you know, we have an option there. Now, since 1870, the court size has been pretty stable at nine, um, but at a very similar moment in our, in our history during the New Deal era, um, a Supreme Court that was hostile to the enormously necessary reforms of the New Deal um, and FDR's plans to 
make sure that the country did not continue to fall into immense economic precarity and to get people out of poverty and to pass social security and the National Labor Relations Act um, was facing an enormously hostile court that kept striking down minimum wage laws, laws on overtime, laws on anything to do with economic rights on you know theories of constitutional law that are now considered completely you know completely marginal. And so FDR threatened to pack the courts and he got pretty close. He didn't actually add justices to the number of the nine that are on the Supreme Court today, but through that threat was able to push the court to stop striking down New Deal legislation. So, you know, I court packing has this rich history and it has worked before. A key question for, you know, the expansion question is uh, the number of justices to add. Some scholars and activists have talked about adding two justices to the court. Um, if we do that, the court would be six Republican appointees and five Democratic appointees. Personally, I don't think it makes a ton of sense for Democrats to fight like hell to pack the court, um, only to still stay behind, but that is on the table. The most common suggestion is to add four justices, that will be one for every federal circuit. Um, another thing that we need to put on the table is we can and should expand the lower courts. Like I said, Donald Trump has now appointed a quarter of active federal judges. And every year, about 277,000 cases are filed in federal courts. The Supreme Court will take maybe 120. So the vast majority of cases are decided. In fact, every single case that Jamie, Alexandra, and Sarah talked about was decided at the lower court. And so, you know, that is extraordinarily important. The stakes are really high. Um, and some of the people that Trump has appointed are shockingly extreme. Judges who are overturning COVID restrictions on the basis of outdated and unacceptable precedent. Judges who, um, who think, as Alexander said, that civil rights enforcement is evidence of discrimination against white men. But even if the lower courts weren't dominated by the Federalist Society and people who are opposed to our values, you know, I think we ought to really think about expanding them to make sure that people can have timely access to justice. Congress used to regularly increase the size of the lower courts with sort of a standard move as the population grew and the number of cases we have grew, like makes sense. Um, but we, we stopped doing that in 1990, even though the population has increased a great deal. Um, even though the judiciary themselves and you know they're sort of apolitical theoretically thinks that the court you know they think that there needs to be more judges because their caseloads have just gone up and the amount of work they have has gone up and so it takes longer to resolve cases than it used to but the fact that you know judges have a really high caseload is also a motivating factor behind a lot of doctrines that lead people to being pushed out of court the fact that um you know, this is sort of a policy concern that you see in a lot of cases about, say, forced arbitration. Um, forced arbitration is a process where um, you can be required to sign a contract to get your phone or to open a bank account or to be hired at your job. Um, and the large majority of consumer contracts and the majority of non-union employment contracts now contain this like small provision called a forced arbitration agreement. And if you sign that agreement, you can't go to court, you are legally barred from going to court to pursue your rights if you face discrimination or harassment or fraud. And so a part of that's like a really fucked up situation. And it is motivated in part by the fact that, you know, judges are like, well, like we just have too many cases. So I say, let's have more judges and timely administration of justice. Another option is term limits. Um, some people have proposed 18 year term limits. The purpose of this recommendation is to make sure that court's composition is determined by who wins elections, not the random chance of when someone passes away or through strategic retirements, right? We saw Justice Kennedy retire during the Trump administration, um, potentially uh, with the specific goal of making sure that his mentee, Justice now Justice Kavanaugh, could be appointed to his seat, you know, because you know, people on the right have most of the seats. We do not want them to be able to strategically retire 
um, specifically when Republicans are in charge. And look, Republicans have now nominated 15 out of the last 19 Supreme Court justices despite losing the popular vote in six out of the last seven presidential elections. And so, you know, I think we ought to consider term limits to make sure that the composition of the court reflects our democratic and popular will. Another option is rotating or random seats. Um, under this proposal, every judge on a court of appeals would be part of a lottery that's randomly appointed to the Supreme Court. So those nearly 200 justices, well, 200 for now, uh, would then hear cases in randomly assigned panels of nine. One concern I personally have about this is that random drawing could very well mean that by Random chance, um, the next case over, say, states limiting abortion or medication abortion during the COVID-19 pandemic could just happen to come before a 7-2 kind of far-right panel. And then, like, Steve Menashe writes an opinion completely striking down Roe v. Wade. So, like, I think that, you know, maybe there's something to be worked out in that particular recommendation, but want to put everything on the table. You know, the stated goal of a rotating appointment is to sort of depoliticize appointments, which it might. Um, I think here at PVP, we are pretty skeptical of the idea that law can be depoliticized or, you know, that it's accurate to frame it as sort of neutral. And, you know, I worry that that then just makes the stakes of confirmation bites less clear. Um, so that's, but that is an option on the table. So, like I said, there are two buckets of these. One is who's on the court. Um, but in I think the, there's a broader issue than just who's on the court, right? Um, one, you know, we are living through an era of like real movement power. And, you know, we believe that our movements have a chance at winning by building popular support and by winning Congress and winning the presidency. And I think it's very possible that we will pass big voting rights legislation, that will pass a Green New Deal, that will pass Medicare for all in the next 10 years. And we could build that powerful support and we could still lose in the courts. And that is bad because I believe in those policies, but it's also bad because it's a democratic embarrassment, right? That, you know, this small group of wealthy people on the Supreme Court can have a veto power over popular will. And so, you know, I think in addition to simply changing the composition of the court, some people are reconsidering whether or not you know, we want the court to have quite as much power as it currently does. Um, some options that are put forward are to require a supermajority, like a six or seven, six, three or seven, two majority to strike down federal legislation. Um, and others are to um, even strip some of the jurisdiction that these courts have um, and just say that certain things are completely off the, the table for the court to consider. I think, you know, the exactly what these reforms could look like are, is not quite developed yet. Like, I don't think we have a clear picture of what that would look like. Um, but I think disempowering the courts is something that, you know, we in the progressive movement ought to be giving some thought to and taking seriously um, as an option in this moment. So I've been talking for a very long time. Um, I want to um, make sure that we have a chance to answer any audience questions. Um, so if you have any questions, please go ahead and drop them in the Q&A or drop them in the chat. And um, we are happy to um, answer anything that you are wondering about. Great. Um, I do see a great question about whether or not there's anything we can do as student organizers from an attendee. And that is a great question. Um, the People's Parity Project is building a um, nationwide movement for court reform um, in, you know, in whatever option the movement ultimately decides to go for. Um, we are uh, currently encouraging everyone to join this. Um, and I know that um, I know that my colleague Molly is going to drop a link uh, to join our Slack into the chat. So if you're interested in getting involved, that's where to start and we'll figure out how to plug you in. Great. Um, does anyone have any other questions for me or for the other panelists? I saw a question here about um, alternatives to suing for deliberate indifference. Um, 
so if a if a survivor isn't able to um, make out a deliberate indifference claim, basically, are there other routes to legal liability? You know, I, I think that it's, you know, um, hard for anyone to give sort of a definitive answer about an individual case without, you know, digging into the facts. So uh, to the person who asked the question, um, this is not a uh, uh, you know, legal advice, but um, you know, I, I think that now is a time when sexual harassment lawyers are trying to think creatively about how to break out of the deliberate indifference framework, um, including by um, identifying some of the uh, sex stereotypes that motivate schools, this treatment of survivors, um, and in using some of the um, the case law that's been established by respondents that basically make it a lower burden to show sex discrimination in these contexts. So, you know, I don't have a bunch to, to point you to now, um, but, you know, we are, we are aware of the need for alternatives. Um, I also see a question in the chat about whether or not there have been any details from the Biden campaign about how they would think about Title IX. Yeah, I, I can start off on this one. Um, so we know some about what the Biden-Harris ticket um, would do for Title IX. And really, they've actually spoken to sexual harassment, sexual violence more broadly outside of just the student context. But um, as far as Title IX, um, they have committed or Biden has committed to um, restoring guidance that uh, under Title IX that would kind of push Title IX back toward being uh, an actual civil rights law with teeth and not a really anti-civil rights law. Um, what that exactly would look like is kind of to be determined. And I know that I'm sure that in the coming weeks and months, there are going to be a lot more push from pushes from advocates um, to make clear what uh, survivors and survivor advocates really want a Biden-Harris administration to be doing on that. One thing that we haven't talked much about today, um, but that is a critical aspect of Title IX, is the protection for transgender students. And we've been talking about um, sexual violence um, more narrowly than that, but it, uh, sexual harassment and sexual violence under Title IX um, does include also uh, discrimination on the basis of sex, discrimination against transgender folks. And um, though that exact question hasn't been determined by the court, we're confident that that is what it includes. And so the Biden-Harris ticket has committed to making sure that Title IX is once again used as a way to protect transgender students um, rather than to hurt them because that's another thing that's been, been happening and that um, some of the, the courts have been allowing to happen um, in recent years is discrimination against trans folks in the name of protecting women. Um, which is not what Title IX is for. So that's something that we're certain on. Um, also really kind of, you know, uh, a little bit outside of what we've been discussing, but super critical to protecting survivors is uh, discipline of students. Uh, discipline of student survivors is a huge issue. Um, like almost a fifth of student survivors report that they've been punished for something related to coming forward about their experience of violence. And under um, the Obama administration, the Department of Education put forward guidance around school discipline, trying to make sure that the racially disproportionate rates, of, uh, raci racially disproportionate school discipline didn't continue um, unaddressed and making sure that black and brown students in particular, LGBTQ students, students with disabilities, um, and other marginalized students weren't being punished more based on their identities or in connection with their identities. That's something that the, the, the Department of Education Secretary DeVos under the Trump administration has again rolled back and the Biden-Harris ticket has committed to putting guidance back in place to make sure that students of marginalized identities aren't being disproportionately punished. So those are just a few of the highlights. One really quick thing I want to flag, um, just because Zach, your question was specifically about Title IX processes, um, and you know I think the one trend that we're seeing both with the Trump administration and with um, the courts um, as they drift further right is singling out allegations of sexual harassment for unique scrutiny um, that school that the department and courts are requiring schools. Um, to subject these allegations, to treat these allegations as though they are uniquely suspect, um, they're uniquely likely to be false, and so require unique procedural um, 
uh, investing, you know, unique procedures to protect people accused of the same. Um, and I, I think that th those are rooted in just centuries old um, misogynist stereotypes uh, about, you know, women who cry rape because they're sad that someone didn't crawl the next day or because they got pregnant. Um, and so part of what I'm hoping that we will see is both the agency and courts start to treat sexual harassment actually more like other harms, um, rather than sort of trying to create new rules whole cloth every time. And I do worry that um, it's not just that courts are gonna, if we don't fix the problem, that it's not just gonna be that courts require schools to treat these allegations that way, but the courts themselves will start, will go back to um, a previous era, you know, earlier sort of in the 20th century of actually requiring unique procedural protections for rape allegations, you know, within their own courts. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. I think we're at the end of our time, but if you want to get more involved in Know Your Nine's work, um, Sarah or Jamie, could you give a quick explanation on how people could plug in? Yeah, I'll give a 30 second spiel about the Know Your Nine toolkit. If you are a student organizer and you're interested in, um, you know, pushing your school and your state uh, legislators to do better, Know Your Nine's created a toolkit that kind of gives you an overview of the rule. Um, if I were still in college, I would kind of do a side by side of the rules requirements in my own school's Title IX policy. And unfortunately, you are likely to find a lot of gaps. Um, hone in on those gaps, get familiar with them. You can come and ask any of the policy organizers if you have questions about your school specific policy, um, but then you know, campaign around it, um, identify the decision makers at your school and you know, hold them accountable. Um, I'll drop a link in the chat so that you can kind of see exactly what our resources look like. All right, well, thank you all so much. So. Basically, the takeaway is join Know Your Nine, join the People's Parity Project, and let's unring the courts. All right, thanks, everybody.